morning, our reading this morning is taken from Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 29. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, and my gospel, as my gospel declares. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. The circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Cinta, for reading the word of God to us, and thank you, Raj, for leading us this far. If you can keep that passage open, it will be helpful to your friends. We're going to work our way through that passage that Cynthia just read to us. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, the hymn we sang just before the reading of God's word. And I'm hoping that that is true for each and every one of us, especially those who claim to believe in Jesus, those who claim to be Christians today, that your hope is on that, that Jesus paid it all. Your hope is not based on any other thing that you do except that and that alone. Because if it's not, you are heading, heading for a great disappointment on that great judgment day. That's the topic of today, God's judgment with or without the law. If you have the law, you have access to the Bible, you're going to be judged the same way with people who did not have access to the Bible. You're going to be judged by what you have done. 
by an all-knowing God. Well, let's bow our head as we turn to these verses that was read to us and hear what God is to say to us this morning. We need to ask for his help. Let's bow our head in prayer. Father, as we turn to your word, we come to you. We acknowledge that, Lord, your word is extremely difficult for us to understand first and foremost and to accept it and apply it into our lives. We need your help for both of those things. We ask you that by your spirit, who is our resident teacher, you will teach us, you will open up your way to us and help us to understand it. But at the same time that you will soften our hard hearts and that you will give us grace to be receptive to your word and the will to apply it into our lives. We pray this for the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ and for our edification. Amen. You remember that uh, last Sunday we looked at Romans chapter 2 verse 1 to 11 where the Apostle Paul was telling us that no human being will have excuse before God and no human being will escape God's judgment because God shows no partiality. He shows no favoritism, no partiality whatsoever. We are all going to stand before God. What does that mean? That simply means that no matter who you are, where you're from, whether you're rich or you're poor, you're black or white, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, you're going to be judged the same. You are going to be judged by the same standard like everybody else. You are going to be judged according to what you have done. And I'm sure that when you hear words like that as Cynthia was reading them to us that we will be judged according to what we have done, you'll agree with me that that pauses a serious problem for all of us. Because if we are going to be judged according to what we have done individually, that simply means none of us has any form of excuse before God. And none of us are guiltless before him. So Paul here in our passage, Romans 2 verse 12 to 29, is talking about the end days when history books will be opened. History books that are not written by man. History books that are written by God who knows all things. And those books are going to be opened and we're going to be judged according to the record that God has for each and every one of us. I know that we can have skew of judgment in our thinking because we're living in the world that is, it, the justice is polluted. It, it's, it's not what it should be. We might end up thinking that we might be able to manipulate God one way or the other. We're going to hear today that there will be no way that we could manipulate God on that day of judgment. Books are going to be open. Books that are, are written by the all-knowing God. Books of history. History of your life and my life. Listen to what Revelation 20 verse 11 to 15 says. It's important to, to read this passage. I know it's long, but we need to hear this as a foundation from which we can then move on and understand what Paul is saying here about the great judgment day. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. 
From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown, thrown into the lake of fire. That's what's going to happen on the day that Paul is talking about in our passage here. There will be lots of talking this time around, but it's not you and I who will be doing the talking. The talking will be done by God. And that talking will be based on the books of history that are written by God. And some people will bring a lot of things that they have put their hopes on. In Matthew, we read 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Listen to this. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Those are scary, chilling words. They're scary because they final. This is the final day. And the judge is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Each word that comes out of his mouth is final. If he says, well done, my faithful servant, that word is final. It cannot be challenged. If he said, I never knew you, depart from me, that word is final. It doesn't matter what you had done. If your hope is hanged on the things that you're doing, you're heading for the disappointment on that day. We all have good things on which we hang our hopes on. Good things that will never help us on this day. And I want you to ask yourself as we work our way through this passage, what are the good things that I'm hanging my hopes on? If you were to die today, and stand before God. And God asks you the question, why should I allow you into my kingdom? What will be your answer? There are three main things that Paul is saying here about the judgment day. The first main thing is that ignorance on that day will not help you when you stand before God. Ignorance will not help you on judgment day. You will not escape God's judgment by pleading of ignorance, by a plea of ignorance, rather, because no one is ignorant of God's requirement, none whatsoever. Jews and Gentiles, of which that 
While the Bible divides people, they will be judged equally and fairly before God on that day. Verse 11, verse 12 to 13 says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. When the Bible talks about perishing, it's simply meaning they will be judged and condemned to eternal death without the law. They're not going to stand before God and plead ignorant and say to God, I did not have access to the gospel. I did not have access to the Bible. The Bible says they will be judged without the law because God is a just God. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Those who have access to the word of God, God will judge us according to what is recorded here in the Bible. And the Bible tells us that the whole book is about Jesus. So it simply means you will be judged according to what you have done about Jesus. Verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. We are not made righteous by attending the church every Sunday and attending all Bible studies and hearing the truth of God and studying it and knowing it, that is not enough. If it was enough, let me tell you, the Pharisees would have been the best buddies of Jesus. They knew the law by head. They could repeat it without reading it. but they were his enemies. They didn't like what he was saying because all of a sudden he comes, he takes what they've known since their childhood as the statues of God and he, he, he internalized it unless it is in the heart, unless it is working in your dark heart. It's of no value. It's not how much you know, it's what you do with what you know when it comes to the Bible. We need to be reminded on, of that because we pride ourselves with, as a denomination that takes God's word seriously and that is good that we do so because they're becoming lesser and lesser churches that takes this book seriously. But dear friend, if we think that is enough, we've got another thing coming. If this book is not going through my life, it's just me going through it every year, and I pride myself on that, but there is no change that is produced by this book. I'm not less than the Pharisee before God, and I'm heading for a great disappointment on that day. So in verse 12 to 13, Paul explains the implications of verse 11. God has no partiality, has no favoritism. I'm not going to stand there and God look at me that this is a favorable sign of mine. No. There is no one who is a favorite to God. The only person that God loves and will approve is a person who takes him seriously on his word. A person who does what he says. So that's how God is going to judge people. It doesn't matter if you did not 
have the law. Gentile people without the Mosaic law, verse 12a says, will not be judged by the law, but will perish apart from the law. Nevertheless, they're going to be judged. Do you know why Paul has already told us that God has revealed himself in creation? so that no man can have excuse before God. I know we say that, oh, that doesn't hold water much. It does hold water much. Anything that God does, he does it purposefully. And the, the revelation on creation should lead you to behave yourself in such a way that acknowledges that there is a God. And in those places, you will be judged whether you have read the Bible or you haven't. And you will be judged by this just God. So Paul continues to say that in verse 12, those with the law, the Jews, in verse 12b, should not think that just because they were given the law of God, they are necessarily exempt from judgment. They will be judged by the law. And that is deadly serious because none of them kept the law. None of us can keep the law. So if your hope is on your performance, if your hope is on keeping the law of God, it's better be perfect Everybody knows the requirements of the law. Everybody knows right from wrong. Do you know why? You know it by the mere fact that you are a descendant of Adam and Eve. You remember what Adam and Eve's sin was? It was eating the tree of knowing good and what? And evil. We are born with that. Is in our genes. We know what is evil. We know what is good. The question is, what do you do with it? That will be the underlying question before the judgment throne of God. So those who had access to the Bible and those who, did, who didn't, will be judged the same before God. Romans 2 verse 14 to 15 says, For when Gentiles who, who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They saw that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuses, accuse or even excuse them. <laughs> there are going to be no excuse before God. We're living in the world where the are some unbelievers, people who live a life that when you look at them, you think they should be Christian. When you come closer to them, you realize that they, they're not Christians. They tick all the boxes of requirements of the lifestyle of a child of God. They pay their taxes, even in the corrupt government like ours, I can say that because it's a known factor that we've got the government that is so corrupt that they excel on that. But we're still required to pay our taxes. And you'll be doing well to pay your taxes. <laughs> You're looking at me, and, are you a brick? Who would do that? Christians do that. We don't pay our taxes because our government, they good. We pay our taxes because God is good. He has commanded us to do so. 
we pay our taxes in obedience to our God and leave the rest with him. Believe me, he is a just judge. People might escape judgment in our courts. None of us will escape judgment on his courts. Our rulers, they're going to count on him, and they need to hear that. There is a ruler on whom they're going to stand and give an account as to how they've governed us. None of us will escape God's judgment. None. So here in verse 12, 13, Paul prefigures what he's going to say in chapter 3, verse 9 to 20, where he says, all people are guilty and will be punished according to God's justice. And when the Bible says all, it means all. On judgment day, man's secret thoughts will be exposed. Verse 16 says, on that day, when according to my gospel, says Paul, God judges the secrets of man by Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? The gospel that is without the judgment of God is not the gospel. Paul's gospel included that. He says, according to his gospel. It has to come with judgment. Because otherwise it makes no sense why Jesus has to become a man, why he has to suffer the way he did, why he has to die that dreadful death of the cross. When you look at that and you think about his death, you have to see God's judgment on Christ, though he knew no sin. He was judged on my behalf, so a sinner like you and I could be accepted by a holy God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he treaded on the cross willingly. He took my sin so that I could receive his righteousness through faith in his name. That's the gospel the apostle Paul preached. That's the gospel we're preaching today. If your hope is hanged on anything, I mean anything other than Jesus, you're going to be disappointed. So the ultimate day of accountability will come when God finally judges all. The point that Paul is making is this. The secret of the heart of man will be brought into broad daylight on that day. when God judges the secrets of man. Things that you don't know about me, things that I don't know about you, things that we don't know about our leaders will be brought to open on that day. I said that last Sunday, there would be no time of toy-toying and boycotting that and say this is, this is impinging on my constitutional rights. You know, once someone says that, then you know you're in for the battle because the Constitution says nothing when it comes to that. It depends how much you got, how good lawyers are on your side, then you're going to win. And you ask yourself then, who, whose right was impinged here? That's the madness of democracy. The fact that Jesus will be the judge, Paul says that is in accordance with the gospel that I preach. He will sit on the, on the judgment throne and everybody else will stand before him. And he will judge so on the judgment day we won't be acceptable to God by pleading ignorant because no one is ignorant of God's requirement friend no one if you claim to be an atheist 
You need to hear this. There is nothing in God's book that is called atheist. In, in the Bible, atheists are people who are suppressing the truth by their wickedness. And that excuse won't work on the judgment day. It won't. You will be judged like everybody else. You might think that you're sophisticated, you're clever today. You come up with all, all argument to disprove that there is a God. You will be a fool on that day because that's what the Bible says atheists are. People who claim that there is no God, the Bible says the fool says in his heart there is no God. And that's what sin makes all of us to be. It makes us fools. And what is worse is that in the making of us fools, we think that we're clever. And therefore, no one can tell us anything. We remain in ignorance and we think we know it all. Sorry, when you turn 60, you just don't care what people think about you. You just talk like Jesus is coming tomorrow and you sleep, you wake up, you see that it's another day and you think about what you said. Oh, shoo, why did I say that? But that's the truth. And we need to hear it. And there is no other place where you're going to hear it except in the church of Jesus Christ where this book is open. You will not be acceptable to God by pleading ignorant. The second main thing that Paul is saying here is that knowledge will not help you on judgment day. Knowledge is something that we pride ourselves with. We love the Bible. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. We love to be in the church where the Bible is taken seriously. But as I said, that is not enough. This book is not God. It's a book about God. This book should lead you to God, the person. If it doesn't do that, it's not enough. We don't worship the book. We love the book because it's where God reveals himself. So knowledge of this book on its own, it won't help us on the judgment day. You will not be acceptable to God by boasting in the knowledge of the Bible. It doesn't matter how much of it you know it. It really doesn't matter on the judgment day. It's what you did with Jesus that will matter. Verse 17 says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, what does Paul mean by if you call yourself a Jew? He means if you call yourself a person who is in covenantal relationship with God, people who belong to God, people who are born into this privilege of being part of people of, of the people of God. And the privileges of being a Jew are laid down there in verse 17 down to 19, where Paul called talk about them as a Jew, they were proud and pleased to be Jewish because it meant that they were special people of God. They were not Gentiles. They relied on the law of God, a pride of knowing the law of God that makes you wise. Have you ever thought why they became so foolish? That's what the Bible does if you don't take it seriously. You accumulate its knowledge, you ignore it, you don't apply it in your life, you're going to become the biggest fool of them all. Because you know what is right, but you don't give a thought as to how it applies to your life. You brag about your relationship with God. That's what they were bragging about in verse 17. Because they were chosen people of God. 
You know his will, in verse 18. The will of God is in his book. And you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, in verse 19. That's what they should have been. And when Jesus came, he said this of, his, of their teachers. He said, if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into the pit. And Pharisees, they didn't take that nicely. But those are the privileges, and those are the privileges that are ours as Christians today. We've got this book. This book makes the foolish wise. That is, if you apply it in your life. Imagine you're sitting in the pews, let's say that for, for a moment, pretend you are a Jew. And the letter to the Roman is written. We're sitting here as a congregation. We're gathering. And, and the, everybody comes with excitement. There is a letter from the Apostle Paul. They've heard about Paul and his writings. Now he has written a letter that is so long to them as a church. And this letter is read. And it comes to this part where it says, if you call yourself a Jew, I'm sure you will be asking yourself, what do you mean, Paul? I am a Jew. How can you ask that? I am a Christian. How can you ask that if you call yourself a Christian? And he turns to CCP members, those who are professing to be a Christian, and say, don't just assume you are fine if you call yourself a Christian. Don't assume you are fine because you are sure you are in right standing with God because you pray the, the sinner's prayer and you sign up for membership as it was announced this morning that if you want to be a member, by the way, to be a member of the church is an important thing that you can do as a Christian. Belong to a group of people and be accountable because that's how God structures the church. And membership provides you with that. To a church, but that is not enough. Signing up of membership does not make you a Christian. You're memorizing the passages of scriptures and you have led many people to the Lord. Even in the Bible study group that you're leading, you want to get deeper into the things of God. You're so zealous of the Bible and you think that you are in right standing with God because of all of those things. My dear friend, all of these things are good things but they're not saving things. They're not. Your hope cannot be hanged on that. It has to be God. Your hope is not on our God-man, Jesus Christ himself. All these things, as you're going to hear, they become null and void before God. They won't help you on the judgment day. Verse 19 to 20, and if you are sure that you, you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light of those who are in darkness, and an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, here is where the tie hit the road. Paul said, if you call yourself a born again Christian, then practice what you preach. Practice what you claim to be. And it's here where the tie hit the road. Verse 21 to 23 says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? That's a question. You who says that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery yourself? You who abhor idols, do you rob the temple of idols? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law? You boast on the Bible. At the same time, can you afford to boast on the Bible, and then you'll be found living a life that is ungodly, constantly. 
Don't you like the Bible? You can accuse the preacher of anything, you know. Paul is asking those questions. You, you, you see it. It's right there in the Bible. That's why we've got Bibles on the pews. So that you do not take the preacher. You read it yourself. We say to people, do not steal and turn around and we, 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 we don't pay our taxes. And it's easy not to pay your taxes, especially if you don't tithe. You know, people that does not tithe, they don't have a problem of, pay, of not paying the taxes. If they're robbing God, they're stealing from God. What it is to steal from men? It's nothing. It's easy. They do it without thinking. So we say to people, do not commit adultery. And many of us are in the process of divorce because we do not, we, we, we are not faithful to our spouses. That is an indictment in the church. When people go through divorces because they just can't be faithful to their spouses and they claim to be Christians. And you know, when people see a behavior like that, what they say? They say, I will never come to church. You know why? Because church is full of hypocrites. And we, we laugh at that. And sometimes we go to as far as to say to them, no, there's still a place of one more hypocrite. But they mean that the church is full of people who know the truth, but they don't live out the truth. And that's an indictment to the church. And verse 24 says, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of that kind of conduct. As Christians today, when we conduct ourselves in a, in a manner that is ungodly before God, the name of Jesus is blasphemed. The third and final thing that the Apostle Paul is saying here in verse in verse 12 to 29 of chapter 2 is that outward religion will not help you on the judgment day. When you see a true and false Jew, I want you to think of a true or false Christian. Look at verse 25. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision become uncircumcision. Do you hear that? It's of value because it's from the Bible. It's a command from the same God. But if you don't obey the Bible from which you get that command, the circumcision becomes nile and void before God. It becomes of no value. And Paul, when he talks about circumcision, I'm sure we all understand that was an outward sign. It was a sign of being in covenantal relationship with God. It was not internal, it was external. It was a sign of being justified by God before God. But it was an external sign. It was given to Abraham by God for all Jewish males as a sign of being set apart for God. But Abraham was never, was not justified or acceptable to God because of circumcision. His faith that was accredited to Abraham as righteousness. Faith in God. Okay? Sign was important because it was a sign that says you're being justified before God. It was an outside, outward sign, not inward sign. So for the Jews, it was a circumcision. But for us Christians, what are the religious signs that we hang our hopes on? It's not circumcision, but is what we're doing here this morning. We come to church, and you hear people that have been coming to this church since I was born. Okay, that's good, but do you know Jesus? What do you mean? I was baptized here. I was confirmed here. That's very good, but do you know Jesus? Because that won't count on judgment day. 
The fact that you were baptized as a baby and you were confirmed as a, as, as, as a teenager, it means nothing. If you don't know Jesus, it means absolutely zero. So we, 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 we put our hope on attending the church, on baptism, even we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. You know, we used to take Holy Communion every Sunday. That's very good. But do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? I give tithe in the church and offering. We just had time of giving to the work of the Lord. And I'm serving in the church. All of these things are good things, but they are not saving things. They are not. Paul says, for circumcision. In verse 10. In, 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 sorry, in verse 25, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. All these things come into church if you obey what God is saying as I'm preaching this morning. It becomes of value. It's good that you come to church. But if you come to church and you hear God speaking to you, you disregard what God is saying, you know what is happening, your heart is becoming harder. You're playing a very dangerous ga game. All of these things are good if you obey the law, but if you break the law, they become useless. Do you know why? For James says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. That's James 2 verse 10 to 11. So if, if you can't keep the whole law, these things, they, they're useless. If you hope, you hang your hopes on them. For he who said, verse 11 of James 2, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. James is saying, the Lord who says, do not steal, is the same Lord that said, do not commit adultery. So if you don't steal and you pride yourself on keeping the law, but you commit adultery, you're still sinning against God. Because it's God who said, don't steal and don't commit adultery. The question is, do we perfectly obey the word of God? The answer to that is no, we don't. So if you're going to trust on your action, your action, they must be super perfect. Your action must be like for the Lord Jesus. He is the only man who perfectly obeyed God. If you're going to hang your hopes on obeying the law and coming to church and doing all the external things, you better make sure that you are capable to obey the whole law. Let me advise you, the Pharisees failed. And all of us has failed. That's the reason why Jesus came. It's because we all fail us when it comes to keeping the law. It's only him. And he did it. Though he was God, he did not have to keep the law. He did it for you and I. So that when we trust in him, we are accepted by God as people who have perfectly obeyed God. That's the gospel. We don't. Keep the law. Verse 26 to 27 says, So if a man who is uncircumcised keep the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Of course, by God. That's how God's going to regard him. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you. That's simply Paul simply saying, you know, if the pagan is living a life that is in accordance to the law of God, to, the, to God's requirement, 
And you who is a born-again Christian, you're not living your life according to the Bible. And this man who is not a Christian, who does not come to church, who does not give tithe and offering to church, who is not baptized, but he lives a clean life, Paul says he's going to condemn you as a born-again Christian. And he will be right. Because he's living a life that should be lived by me as a born-again child of God. But for whatever reason, I'm not committed to Christ that I claim to love, to obey him. This is, this is, this is scary, but it's the reality. So no one is part of the covenantal people of God who is merely one outwardly. Religious external things does not make you part of the people of God. Just as external circumcision without a circumcised heart did not make the Jews who were physically Jews to be Jews. Only those who were living by faith were Jews. Verse 28 says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. So what does God want from you and me? God wants genuine believers. That's what God wants. A true Jew or a Christian is the one circumcised in the heart. Verse 29, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. God requires something that you cannot do for yourself. You can't circumcise the heart. I think I've never done it, but if someone wants circumcision, I think I can do it. You know, I just need to hear how far do you cut, and then I can cut that. But I, I can't circum you can't circumcise your heart. That's the work of God. It's beyond your reach. You need Jesus to have a circumcised heart. That's the point that Paul is driving here. He takes everything that we hang our hopes on so that we are stripped naked before God. We've got nothing in our hand that we can bring to him. Simply cling on the cross. That's what he's heading to. Outward religious practices won't count. They won't come, dear friends. And if you've been in the church for years and you have never bowed your knee to Jesus, you need to do it quick. Because anything else won't count. It won't stand before God on the judgment day. God requires new birth. I need more than just a makeup to be accepted by God. I need a heart surgery. And that can only be done by Dr. Jesus. He is the only specialist for that. Have you bowed the knee to him? On that day, we won't be able to boast or to plead ignorant before God. We won't be able to say, I didn't know, I didn't know any better, God. That won't work. You won't be able to boast in knowledge of the Bible because though you know the Bible, you have failed to live to live it out. If there's anyone in the house who can raise his hand and say, you know, I, I live by this book, 
and I am able to, to obey everything that is here. You can raise your hand to your own peril to prove to yourself that you are a liar. None of us, including me, I haven't. I trust in Jesus who did obey this book to the letter. And that obedience is in my account. As long as I trust in him, my account is full of Jesus' obedience. Even when I fail and confess to him, God forgives me quickly because my account is full with Jesus' obedience to his word. He is my savior. Is he your savior? On that day, you won't be able to boast on your religious performances because you know you have broken the laws of God. Only Jesus. Let's bow our head. Only Jesus. The good thing about Jesus, you can receive him right now. You can receive him alone on your bed. He's ever there to save and is drawn to a genuine repenting heart that cries up to him. He's a sensitive savior. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Father, that it speaks like no other words that are out there. It speaks direct into our heart. For that, we give you thanks and praise, Heavenly Father. And I do pray that, Lord, you will continue by your spirit to open your word to us the only way you can, better than any of us put together, to each and every person that heard your word this morning. You will continue to open it up to us, Lord, and bring us to our knees before King Jesus before it's too late. We ask this for his glory and for our edification as your church. In Jesus' name, amen.